I'm Bill Bacinas. I am with Infinidat. I'm the Director of Product Marketing. And this I, area, I'd like to talk to you about specifically our products that we've recently announced were fr complete fresh generations of our previous platf uh, storage platforms. Infuse OS. When I first got to Infinidat, they had a very unique set of offerings from a storage perspective, a storage solution perspective. Funny enough, the operating system didn't have a name. And that's where the power of everything that we do comes from. Now, why is that in fact the case? Because we design no hardware, okay, none. We do not design controllers, we do not design interfaces. We design software that sits on top of commodity components. We use standard enterprise class servers for our controller nodes. We use st standard InfiniBand interconnects between those nodes. We use standard uh, storage components on the back end. Today, we still actually use SaaS. And people might be surprised by that, but we literally pay no penalty for what the back end storage components are because of how our software is architected. Let me take you through Infuse OS really quickly. It's a software defined storage architecture that runs across all of our infrastructure platforms. We have no differences between what we run on prem and in the cloud. Infuse OS is based on technology that provides triple redundancy across our architecture using, again, commodity components, which is pretty unique, not having to tie software to very specific kinds of hardware or functions, uh, hardware functions, in order to maintain availability, okay? So, and it also ties and builds our performance characteristics. One of the unique things that we provide is something that we call neural cache. Neural cache creates a large shared pool of DRAM memory, which is a patented piece of architecture that allows us to have extremely high performance and extremely high levels of cache interaction and cache hits. So with that, we can maintain extremely high levels of, of performance, almost regardless of the workload. Everything is cache oriented. All rights hit cache, all rights are acknowledged by cache. The back end is then optimized with a software RAID structure that we call InfiniRAID. And those work together to know exactly where the data resides anywhere in the system and can be accessed by any of the three node controller node architecture. So it's triple redundant, it's highly available. We guarantee 100% availability with our systems. We provide extremely high performance because of the DRAM uh, neural cache architecture that we have. Many of our customers will see greater than 90% cache hits within our system. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, Rohan here. So when you say that all rights hit cache, so the rights and the cache is also three-way replicated? Yes. Okay, so... That, yeah, that, and, the, there's redundancy built into how the cache, how everything is written to the cache in a redundant fashion as well. Okay. And then based on the, obviously, the st fairly standard caching techniques as to how long something stays in cache, et cetera. Yeah. But the way that we interact also with um, the InfiniRaid architecture, which, by the way, just sits, on, on, sits and manages JBOT or JBOF, right, on the back end allows us to know exactly where that data, how that data is laid out. So if something happens not to be in cache or parts of it are in cache, we, we have a very detailed map and we have a very efficient way to prefetch and pre-stage data associated with what's being written and captured or requested in cache. Just curious to know like why triple redundancy, the old architectures that I used to see were dual controllers where the writes used to hit the cache itself, and those uh, RAM like was backed by a, a battery, and that's how they used to do. But th these RAMs are not backed by batteries, right? No. So you know when you think about other architectures like that's right, v v Max, right? You know, Power Max today, um, eight controllers, you know, eight engine sixteen controllers. Those all work in pairs, basically. Right. Right. We're a true cluster. Right? We're, we're a full peer-to-peer -peer environment, right? 
if you happen to lose two controllers and a that's two controllers and an engine, right. right? And some of those solutions, you've lost access. You have data unavailability. You don't have data corruption, but you have data unavailability. We don't right. have that problem, right? Okay. You know, it's kind of interesting um, how many comments we get from our customers in relation to how efficient not only our um, IO stacks are, but how resilient our systems are, right? We have quotes publicly through um, different websites for different mediums where customers put our solutions in and they don't touch it for years. It runs, right? That's the heart of enterprise, okay? Two, dual controller, a lower based architectures, um, those kinds of things, you know, are fine for certain types of applications and workloads. But when you're really talking about those tier zero, if you will, mission critical applications, where, you know, multi-billion, many tens of multi-billions of dollar corporations need absolute trust in that data inf center infrastructure, we fit the bill. We just, it just works, right? I mean, that's, that's what was so exciting for me when I got to Infinidat and understanding exactly how they do this and the kinds of reliability that they put into the product and the kinds of accolades that our own customers give us based on that. And, you know, our, our footprints within customers grow dramatically. Once they get us in the door and they see the performance characteristics, the availability characteristics, and ease of use characteristics of our product, our footprint extends extreme, expands extremely quickly, right? And just like you mentioned, displacement. There's, can't mention specifically by name, but a large financial company, you, everybody knows them, they see their ads on TV. They displaced 162 competitive all flash arrays in their data center. And today they run, I think, 68, somewhere between 68 and 72 infinite at frames. Are you, right. are you planning on uh, getting to an architecture diagram? A little bit. It's pretty straightforward. It's all software based, three controllers interconnected by InfiniBand. And the back end of that is really all JBOF or JBOT connected, right? So there's nothing special. There's no special sauce in how we actually build the hardware components. It's just a very simple, straight architecture. And the Infuse OS is really specifically driven to enable that specific set of architecture and that level of redundancy. With every data path being redundant, every I.O. path being redundant, and every, um, every controller node being able to address every single a uh, bit of data off of the back end of the system. So if that drives our performance, our scalability, our res cyber resilience, which again is built into Infuse OS, um, allows us to consolidate multiple workloads with guaranteed performance levels to our customer base. So the G4, this is the new, uh, the new, art, the new set of systems that we launched this past spring. Again, it was a refresh of our previous uh, G generation three systems, but we made a pretty dramatic shift. We went from dual core Intel based architectures to a single core AMD based architecture. So we leveraged the AMD Epic CPUs. We went from a total of 48 cores uh, to 24 core CPUs with Intel to a single 64 core CPU with AMD. On average, that gave us 31% more cores with a better power envelope overall for the system, where the system overall was about 20% more efficient on a per car basis. It upgraded us to a PCI Gen, uh, Gen 5 architecture at the server and controller node level. And it also brought us up in leveraging uh, DDR5 uh, DRAM for that caching layer. It increased just by, uh, by doing hardware upgrades, gave us about a 2.5% uplift in the overall performance of the system because we didn't make any major software tweaks because of, again, people depend on us for stability and consistency in the data center infrastructure. So, hey, Bill, we didn't Max, uh, I have a question. Yeah. When, you were, when, you were, when you decided to build these, uh, these new architecture on the, on the AMD CPUs, I suppose that you were making, benchmarking them against uh, not the previous generation on Intel, but the, uh, the processors of the same generation? Before going uh, with that, so what I mean by that is the thirty. I mean the efficiency and the amount of cores is compared to Intel CPUs of the same generation. 
Yeah, the, the, the Intel CPUs are, are, I think, at least a generation old Macs, right? I don't know the exact generation, comparatively speaking, but we had okay. been using the previous generation for, uh, I'd say, three to four years in that architecture. But I can find out specifically what that mapping is, if, uh, should you, you need it. It's not a problem to find that out. I just don't have it top of mind. Okay, thanks. Okay, but in Fuse OS, we actually had to port it over from, um, you know, not only not only from a CPU perspective, but we changed some of the underlying operating environment as well. So it was a big change. We did not add any uh, feature sets and things like that. We have a pretty robust set of features in the product already. We really focused on stability. The rollout has been extremely successful and it's been unbelievably stable. Yeah. So one more follow up question on that. So uh, this new architecture has 31% more cores. So were you saturating cores in the previous architecture? Like what was the need to upgrade core because it upgrades your computing power? So if you're not saturating your compute before. We were. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We were, you know, and, and it wasn't that it wasn't just the compute. It was the buses. Okay. Right when you when you had PCI Gen three stuff in the past, right? Okay. We were really running into problems where we were saturating buses as much as we were the CPUs. We probably still had a little bit of headroom on the CPUs. Okay, but being able to shift over to PCI Gen five, okay, right, gives us a whole, right, opens up a whole new world for us. Right, and we're still right right now. We're we're optimizing for the AMD architecture and the PCIe Gen 5. So we expect to even get more performance out of the system based on software updates as we move forward. Great question. Okay, so when we, somebody asked about, you asked about um, what's our scalability. So we've done a couple of things. Again, I mentioned we started as full frame kind of storage systems. And with our solid state arrays, about oh, a year, or so ago, we actually decided to allow um, us to build these in smaller configurations in a 60% total capacity configuration, an 80% total capacity configuration, or you could still buy a full frame. The 60 can be upgraded to an 80, and an 80 can be upgraded to 100, and so on and so forth. But again, it just allowed for customers to have a lower entry point into the environment, scaling up. This architecture is completely seamless and non-disruptive. Again, that's a core tenant in everything that we do. Now, with the advent of the G4 family, we actually went a little further down market, if you will, or downsized, where we created the 1400T series. The 1400T series is still our full enterprise scale, enterprise class architecture, but limited in overall rack size and overall capacity. People wanted the ability to use what they use in their core data center and remote data centers. They wanted to be able to use it in colo locations and in edge deployments where they wanted that kind of enterprise capability that we provide. So the 1400T is a 14 rack U system that can be installed in customer racks. We typically install or ship in our own our own pre-built racks, but we will allow customers to install in their own racks. So, but again, with the advent of the architecture updates and the controller nodes, it gave us an even better story around consolidation, the amount of total footprint, the amount of workloads that we can consolidate, again, enhancing the TCO and ROI for customers, but also providing them with that small footprint where they can now deploy in remote locations. As soon as we announced it, we had one customer buy 29 of them for warehouses, right? Managing yeah, management systems for their warehouse environments across the country. So we also filled a couple of gaps with our other models too. We also have, you know, I mentioned SSA, which is our solid state. We also still sell hybrid, right? Backend spinning disk. We sell a lot of it, especially in very large configurations where people use it as backup targets, believe it or not. We saw a ton of it, right? We can get 17 petabytes of effective data storage on the back end of a rack. 
in that environment. The other thing I should have touched on probably in the last slide is our architecture. We primarily sell them, you know, most people buy our solutions for block, but about 10% of our customers have extensive file use. And our file stacks are ones that we built and tightly integrate. And they're extremely fast. Our file protocols run as fast as our block protocols, which is very unusual to, to be able to hear that and claim that in many environments. So especially where people are using our systems like our hybrids and backup environments, the fact that they might be interfacing directly to an NFS interface, they don't have to worry about the performance elements and trying to send data down an NFS or an SMB path. So Bill, are you guys deploying this now with just, a, just being a pure file system? Not, no, we still require it to be on a hardware architecture, right? So we're not, we're not selling, we're not separating the software from the hardware. No, no, I mean, just deployed the a stack just to be a file. File. Yes, we do have customers that will deploy just to file. Just there, so the so are you? When I license your software, I only like I license it for old block, block and file. I don't everything. You can license use it one hundred percent. Not separating it out like what NetApp did. Yeah, okay. we we have we have no separation of the data services. Okay. Right. Thanks. It's all bundled. All our replication file services, block services. Infinerate, all our cash and kit, everything is all bundled in. We have we have one we have one optional piece of software which is related to our cyber offering. So is there any have you benchmark yourself against like a filer, like an Isolon or something else? Are you going no, over we, that market no, or are you really just staying away from it? Or yeah, is it still too slow? It, it's not no we it's, <laughs> <laughs> and Eric will hit well, me the, for that one. The, 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 <laughs> Kimberly, unfortunately, the answer, like many answers, is it depends, right? Because, you know, with Isilon, you can, the Isilon or power scale, whatever they're calling it today, has so many different configuration options, yeah. right? You'd have to figure out what it is you want to do, you know, and they have a, a, a different set of the way they integrate protocols and so on and yeah. so forth. Uh -huh. So we're not a, we're not a scale out architecture like they are, yeah. right? We're more of a scale up architecture yeah. from a storage okay. perspective. So we typically don't benchmark ourselves against a complete set of file offerings. But, you know, we have done plenty of um, performance bake-offs with end users, with our customers, who want to have an understanding of how we profile file against those, those particular environments. So okay. even though we don't do it, we, we think it's more important for us to provide uh, the customers the ability to benchmark it against their workloads and not just arbitrarily create a... Um, <laughs> you, you know, our own our own benchmark, which sometimes some of them sound silly, honestly. Right, you, you sort of answered one of the questions I was going to ask, which yeah. is, can you expand the number of controllers? No. OK, we are set at three. That's okay. our architecture. So if you if you build out more than one system, they work in concert at all. They are they no, they're 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 in the, they're standalone. They're standalone entities. Right, we do some. We we can do some feder a little bit of federated management across them, right? But we don't we don't say like create largest clusters of of storage. We do partner on the file side. We do partner with companies like Hammerspace, in where somebody might want to do a, an extremely large scale out file architecture. Say if they're doing LLMs type you know training or things like that, because you know we we again our file systems and our block is so fast and that controller architecture, and because we have a relatively large uh, overall single rack footprint, we can scale very well. But we don't have like a global file system today, right? We have that as part of our roadmap plans and so on. But you know when you start talking about creating these giant data lakes, right, um, for AI training, it's important to have the right set of um, capabilities, and we're not today focused on building that into our storage, but we can partner with, and we have partnered with Hammerspace, where we have customers that will actually scale out using our racks of storage behind this highly parallelized capability that Hammerspace brings, and we can interface that to that with file or block. And that is, what's the use case for that implementation? There's a number of them. Some people just want a, a large global namespace, and they want you know, um, they want all their file storage or a lot of their storage to look like a single file entity. Yeah. Right. That's one of them. Today, Hammerspace has done some things with um, like the GPU direct interfaces, the RMA interfaces and things like that to the GPU farms, 
which we haven't done and we don't have any immediate plans for that. And, you know, part of that goes to the scale of what people are typically looking for. If people are looking to do large scale LLM training, they're looking at, ten, you know, many hundreds of petabytes in some cases of, of overall storage. And a lot of that has to be unstructured. So you have to have a you know, pretty um, robust capability of being able to parallelize that file system, provide that global, um, global file system interface to make that easy. Otherwise, it's a bear. So Hammerspace does a great job in doing that. That's why we partner with, the, with them in some of those environments. Question. Yeah. So what about um, common feature set of immutability, snapshots, that kind of stuff? Yep. Snapshots are hugely important. I'm going to talk a lot about snapshots when we talk about cyber protection. Okay. But again, uh, just real quickly, they're, they're hugely important today because especially when we talk about not data recovery, but business recovery, especially from a cyber perspective. It's important to have a strategy that I call next-gen data protection, which has to be cyber-focused and, and recovery first. Yeah, and more the, about that area. Yeah, we'll I'm going to go into a lot of it in the, in the last section. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir? Uh, uh, based on this picture, um, the left one, the small one, and then the right one with all those JBOFs, uh, the rack completely filled up. Performance is the same, capacity is bigger, but the performance of that- Relatively same. speaking, right? And the smaller one, there is a little bit less performance overall. Because we're, making some drive, software, so. we're making some software updates to fix that, where that will be pretty much on par. The, the DRAM performance is the same regardless. Right. If you have to go to the back end, the number of spindles, because Infiniraid will use um, all, the, all the spindles available to mm -hmm. spread the data across. So there are some slight back end performance differences between um, the different systems strictly based on the number of spindles or the number of devices in the case of solid state. And so it's always one type of controller or you have different Today models one type. giving more performance? Today it's one type. One type. Yep. So it's very consistent across the systems. Yeah, we're looking, we're looking at different options for that as we go forward. So the, yes, so the main main proposition is sorry? so the main proposition looks like is density and resiliency. Yes. Right? Yep. Yeah. Wait, wait. Our 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 core SLAs are 100 percent availability. Hmm. We have cyber guarantees and we have performance guarantees. Right? We'll write, we'll put those in front of any customer that wants them and we stick to them. And we don't we don't have to pay on it because we, we do exactly what we say we're going to do. Customers of, you know, who profile our systems, we not only from an internal benchmark perspective, but even before they buy the system, we can take their I.O. workloads and we can replicate them in the lab. And we can run their exact I.O. workloads on our infrastructure and we can tell them exactly the performance, the, relatively, the relative performance they're going to get from a workload or multiple workloads. That's why our consolidation story is so good. And then we'll write a performance guarantee to that. Wow. Okay. All right. A lot more to cover. I'm going to kind of move on. So um, one thing that, you know, we hear a lot about in the industry over the last year or two is the ability to upgrade controllers. This is very prevalent in the mid-market, um, but we wanted to do something that was, again, unique and something that we wanted to do on a go-forward basis with the, G with the new G4 platform. And we have announced Infiniverse Mobius, and Mobius is a controller up upgrade program. So in the future, you'll be able to literally do an in-place upgrade of the three controller nodes with no migration or no impact uh, or availability impact to the system overall. It'll be a single node swap type of a, a you know, uh, configuration. We don't require um, other support, right? I mentioned we only have one level of support in order to get into the Mobius program. It's, it's there. We don't require um, any prepayment, right? We're doing this as a point in time upgrade. And why are we doing it? A lot of people will say, you know, you have to upgrade your support and there's an uplift to that support to get a new controller three or four years down the road. I'd rather hold on to my money, right? And know what I'm going to exactly what I'm going to invest in three or four years down the road than having a pool of money sitting there and wondering what I'm going to get when that upgrade becomes available. So the whole idea here is, is that we have a program 
<clears throat> with the G4, which is brand new, two or three years down the line, we'll have whatever that next generation platform is. And customers will know exactly what it's going to cost them. They'll know the exact performance capabilities of that particular product. And they'll know exactly how it's going to affect their current infrastructure and things like that. So the whole idea here is, you know, we're not going to hold you hostage to do a controller upgrade by making you prepay for it. I, I don't know about you, but if I buy a car today, I don't want the dealer to try to sell me, you know, a prepayment on my next car four years down the road. I want to have the flexibility to be able to invest in what I want at that point in time. This applies to our um, CapEx-based systems. We have two programs around that. We have a full CapEx purchase program and something we call COD, which is capacity on demand. Capacity on demand can be part of that 60, 80, or 100% infrastructure play, or it could be a full rack where the full rack is on site, but they license or they buy actually just the, a, a portion of the physical capacity or the logical capacity up front, and then they pay as they grow. Right, but the whole the system uses all the capacity all the time. It's just a logical license of the overall capacity. Okay, so we announced that this spring. It's been very well received. Our customers are very much looking forward to what Infiniverse Mobius will bring. The Infiniverse platform, as part of our infrastructure, we have a number of tools being an enterprise class system that provide lots of different insights to the capabilities and what's going on in the system. Infiniverse has been around for a number of years, but what we want to do is we wanted to now take Infiniverse to that next level because it's been this AI cloud-based um, telemetry um, leveraged infrastructure that does a lot of predictive analysis, gives a lot of historical trending, gives customers a lot of feedback on exactly what's going on not only on a per storage system, but across their infinite out of state. And again, we wanted to continue to build on top of what it's already doing by giving it additional capabilities, you know, over time to make it a more powerful platform, a more insightful platform, and become more of that service oriented uh, consumption services type mindset that some people are and some companies are now thinking about uh, moving towards in the future. So we have extensive amounts of telemetry in our systems, being an enterprise class system, huge amounts of telemetry data, which if a customer opts in, gets, will get fed up into our Infiniverse environment. And that is also, again, churned against global, uh, a global footprint of systems and it will do predictive analysis based on the data sets of, uh, or of the um, storage environment that a customer has in their particular system, right? But it uses those historical and global averages. So we're taking that, and again, we're adding to it. This is an extensive tool for our TAs. I mentioned all of our accounts get technical advisors, which is huge. A technical advisor is not a support person, right? Want to be very clear about that. A technical advisor from our perspective is somebody assigned to an account and they become an integral part of that company's storage team, right? They help with planning and application integration, best practices, and so on. That's part of our standard white glove service and support. Customers love it, right? Smaller customers, a single TA might have a few customers. Our big customers have maybe one, some even have so much storage, they have a couple of TAs. And they meet with these folks a couple times a week. They are literally part of the internal storage team. And these guys leverage this tool along with the customers to be able to tell a customer exactly what's going on in their environment. Okay, hey, I'm Brian. Yeah, um, hi, Brian. So I have some, uh, I have some questions based on um, the statement there on actionable insight and predictive analytics AI base. So I think this is the first time I've seen the phrase AI so far, which is um, a record for the presentation so far. But uh, what do you mean by actionable insight? Because I have a background in data and analytics, and that's a term that's banded around a lot. What do you mean by actionable is the first yeah, thing? I, um, I, the, the second point to that, predictive analytics, AI-based. Could you expand a little bit about what you mean by AI-based? Sure. That sit behind that and what yeah. that means? In real yeah, world? so all this telemetry data flows up into an AWS environment, okay. right? Where we built this big infrastructure that collects all this data. 
and uses machine learning techniques and AI learning techniques to analyze all this data and ultimately feed it back, right? Probably the most, the simplest of examples is predictive storage usage, right? You know, if somebody wants to know how fast is my storage growing historically over my set of systems or a particular system, right? When might I run out of storage based on my current usage patterns, right? That's predictive analysis types of very simplistic ones. The other kinds of things that we're adding now that are hugely important to customers in the latest release of Infiniverse were power, and power telemetry data. How important is power today, right? In the data center with customers, right? With the cost of power, especially overseas, right? In, in the EMEA market, the European markets, unbelievably important. And the other piece of it is um, carbon footprints. You know, with so many companies having focused on different elements of ESG and so on and so forth, they need to know as part of their infrastructure, are they in fact meeting their goals not only from a power usage perspective and their power footprint perspective so they can plan and optimize their data centers, but what's their carbon footprint look like? So Infiniverse now has the ability to look at their, um, again, their storage estate based on locality. And they can either plug in their exact power um, costs and things like that, or we can use regionalized power costs for the area that that system lives in and we calculate a carbon footprint on a per system basis. People love it. We just literally rolled it out. You know, those are the kinds of things that when we push all that telemetry data up and we get all this work going on in the code to figure out how to use it, that's the kind of useful information, insightful information that it's providing back. Is that Help again, that, that answers a lot of it, but I think that that's still all pool, right? That's just all just pooling data and displaying it. And I think when you talk about, again, I hear the term a lot, actionable insight, and what I tend to relate that to is that something happens at the end of it. Yeah. Someone gets informed or a trigger gets set to let you know that your disk space is running out or your power consumption is... Right. All, all of that happens too, right? Right. I, I kind of take for granted all the notification aspects of it. Right, but all that happens in the background too. Those high water marks, low water marks, system alerting, it all ties back into all of that. Right, so if if something is going on, and we have, I shouldn't lose the sight of the fact that on the local systems we have what we call Finimetrics, and that's all the local telemetry data that's ultimately fed up into Infiniverse. Right, so even on a local level, they have the real time, all the exact real time data that they're again being alerted on, notified on, monitoring it on in a in that shorter window, and 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 Finiverus is taking that and expanding it over a longer time period to give them more historical based trending analysis and reporting and um, alerting too. So okay, yes, I have a question. So I noticed that in your controllers that. You have three nodes, so yeah. that's the cluster for the controllers that your management plane. What's the LCM involved with all that for the controller side? It, you mentioned it does it all better than it had in the past, but is it is it uh, more of a Kubernetes or container type situation? No, no, we 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 use uh, we use a, a, a Linux distribution. Mm -hmm. Um, on the particular nodes and use some of our own um, RDMA capabilities through interconnects, yep. redundant interconnects over InfiniBand. Okay, okay. So, so those, yeah, the cluster where three nodes and they manage the system, yeah. all yep. the drives, okay. stem place. Yeah. Yep. All right, I'm going to get through the rest of this real quick. We built this to be a plat, pla you know, the ultimate goal of Infiniverse is to be a very platform architecture, right? Where we basically provide, um, it becomes a very, Front, front and center part of our um, forward facing capabilities to our customer base, right? And provides them the kinds of capabilities, insights around data services, cloud infrastructure, um, management and control, the, you know, uh, again, the upgrade and lifecycle management capabilities in a very comprehensive and seamless way. I'm going to continue to move on on this. And, you know, again, I covered a lot of what's on the slide already based on what we've talked about and the, some of the questions that were being asked. But again, it's all around helping manage the overall SLAs that customers need. Not only do we provide, it's one thing to provide guarantees, but we want to make sure that we're providing also the insight to the customers that supports 
those, those SLAs that we're providing them. And again, ties into all of our purchasing models, um, all the ways that, that customers might want to consume data and may want to manage their infrastructure over the long term.